Hey, Lab Code agents, it's Tristan and Nick out here with Jay Papazan. We have the blessing to have uh, him with us today. Jay, thanks for being with us. Uh, Nick, you want to tell him who Jay Papazan is? I would love to. Oh, so, hi, man. some of you know who Jay is already, and for those of you who don't, shame on you. But Jay, <clears throat> um, Jay is the best-selling co-author of The One Thing, uh, which he co-wrote with Gary Keller. And uh, Jay was the editor at HarperCollins Publishers, and uh, now he's the president, the vice president of publishing at Keller Williams Realty. Uh, we love Jay. The One Thing has definitely made a big impact in our real estate career, helping us focus on what we need to do to succeed at a higher level. Um, so let's introduce Jay Papasan live from... Austin, Texas. Hey, Jay, thanks for being here. Man, I'm super happy to be here. Uh, Lab Code Agents is really helping a lot of folks, so thank you all for what you all are doing. Um, I know that, I mean, the community you've built is pretty impressive, so thank you for inviting me here to share probably my favorite message, which is time blocking. Oh, I, Tristan and I, while we do have successful real estate businesses, it's definitely something we still struggle with every single day, right, Tristan? Oh, man, every day. So thanks for uh, being with us. It's going to help out a lot of people, man. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. So let's just get right into it, um, you know, and get people educated on how to block their time. And lead gen, right? That's their first job, first of all. That's it. And you time block for lead gen in real estate. So how do you make that happen and not get lost in the shuffle of servicing the business you created and then looking up one day after the closing and going, okay, now what do I do? Um, and it's hard. This is a tough business, and we all struggle with it. I'll just, just add before we dive oh, in. We so start, if folks have questions, that. what do they do? Yeah, so I was going to say that um, before we start, uh, we're going to post in the group. We're going to pin a post to the top of the group. Uh, for anyone who has questions, leave them in the comments, and Tristan and I will skim those comments, and we'll shout them out at Jay. Um, you know, at different points uh, during the webinar. All right? It's so, already up. Yeah. We'll go there right now. Great. Cool. And at, at the end of this, I'll try to end before the hour. We'll try to get to the best of those questions at the end of this as well. All right. So without further ado, I'll start sharing my screen. And you guys just let me know. How does that look? It, it looks, looks great. beautiful, man. Awesome. Great. Love it. All right, so um, thanks for that introduction. Uh, uh, time blocking is, to me, kind of where the rubber hits the road with uh, the one thing message. It's uh, Hopefully you've experienced the book. If you haven't, definitely check it out. Um, we spent almost five years researching it. Um, it's been out in the world for a little bit more than three years now. We're rapidly heading towards a million sales. Uh, we have 25 translations, so you can find it all over the world. Um, definitely a book that we're proud of and is hopefully making an impact. And we wrote it with real estate agents in mind, even though it's a general business book. And I can just give you a quick recap of how this thing started for context if you haven't heard. Um, back in the summer of, I want to say, 2008, uh, we were creating a course for our company, and it was on, you know, m you know, kind of second year agents, how to move from that starter year to 36 transactions in a year, which in our math said, you've earned your first assistant, right? And... We had a great course pulled together, a lot of accountability, a lot of action. I remember Gary was reviewing it, and he said, you know, let me take this over the weekend. Um, I just kind of want to give it a little pizzazz. And he came back the following Monday, and he had written an essay called The Power of One. And I remember when I read that, I've been in publishing now for 20 years, and I thought, wow, this is my partner, you know, Gary Kellers. This is his good to great, because the essence of how you focus on the most important thing and give it more effort than anything else, I think is truly what has made him as successful as he's become and his company so successful. So it felt like it was perfectly in alignment with his strengths and we could speak with great authority and we could also research it. And so right there before the shift, we started this. And um, I always joke, we were writing a book about focus and we got distracted by the big market shift and wrote the book shift right in the middle of that. That's one of the reasons it took so long but it was a great journey, changed my life, and changed my family's life. Um, I also, I'm going to bring some real estate to this, um, this conversation. I'm not just a guy who's in an office. My wife, Wendy Papazan, and I own the Papazan Properties Group in Austin, Texas, and now also in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, we'll do an excess of 200 transactions this year and probably push 65 to 70 million. So in about six and a half years, she's built a huge business, 
And I can tell you, she's better at this than I am. She knows how to focus on her one thing. She knows how to time block for success. So where I can share that, I will. So really quickly, when I first started talking to Nick and Tristan about this, I was thrilled. I was like, wow, it's another opportunity to talk about my favorite message. As you can see on the screen, I set a goal this year to teach 10,000 people how to time block for success. Uh, we're doing it on all fronts. I'm traveling around the country, teaching this in major corporations. I just booked a gig with Old Navy. Um, so it's a message that's not just in real estate, it's reaching all areas. So thank you again for this opportunity. Hopefully a lot of you will walk away going, all right, I now know what I need to do to start down the path to bigger success and less stress, honestly. Because when you choose to do one thing, you're really saying yes to the most important thing and that helps you say no to everything else. Um, as we wrote in the book, a real yes, a true yes, has to be defended by a thousand no's. That's how big, extraordinary success happens. And I'm going to try to break that down for you, tell you how to do it, why we do it, when we do it. So first off, this is a, a slide that's actually not in the book, but it's something that Gary was teaching for years before we wrote it. And for me, it sums up the challenge we face. And if you look at the three circles on your screen, there's all the things that you could know. There's all the things that you could have and all the things that you can do. And the problem is um, we can't know it all, have it all, and do it all. Um, knowing it all is just impossible because life is too complex. We can't have it all because life offers too much. And we can't do it all because time is limited. And so if you look at that red triangle, that's your choices. I like to think of the part where it oversects, either it overlaps those circles as kind of the slice of the pie we all get to choose. And you can choose to have a full slice or you can nibble around the edges. And the richer experience is to dive into the middle because that's where all the flavor is, right? And I'll, this kind of was an intellectual idea for me, but when we were writing the book, my kids were maybe five and six, um, going into the writing room, and Gary says, you know, where are you going for spring break this year? And Wendy is launching her business. Um, we were in the throes of writing a book and having another book in the background. And I was like, you know what, we just kind of, we're new to Austin, relatively speaking. Um, we're going to have a staycation, you know. We're just going to hang out in Bastrop and go to the Lazy River and maybe see some of the sights. And I remember Gary just being thoughtful. You know, he's my partner, he's my boss, he's my mentor. And he just very quietly said, you realize you only have about 10 spring breaks left. And that hit me with utter confusion. Because you remember, my kids, Gus and Veronica, are five and six. Um, they're very young, and I'm like, what do you mean, 10? And I actually got a little angry and defensive. Um, I knew that this maybe wasn't the best, best investment of my time to do a staycation, but he really highlighted it for me. He said, you realize that you only have about 10 left, and what I mean is that when Gus is 15 or 16, the idea of going on spring break with mom, dad, and his sister, it's not going to be so appealing. So he may want to bring a friend. He may want to go with a friend on their spring break. You know, shock, he may want to bring his girlfriend. So this dynamic of Jay, Wendy, Gus, and Veronica, you've got maybe 10 left. How are you going to use them? And that hit me like a ton of bricks because I'd never thought in terms of scarcity. I was acting like we could just do it all. But that reality felt very true to me because I know, I know that my sweet son is going to be a teenager and hmm. things will change dramatically, right? Well, and Jay, so, I have a question here. Yeah, man. <clears throat> this, this diagram... Who came up with this, man? Because this is pretty genius. Uh, this is Gary. Uh, this is Gary. I mean, he, first and foremost, his one thing is to be a teacher. Uh -huh. He does that through coaching. He does that through books. And that's that's been the thread of his success throughout his career. And so I love this because, you know, for me, when I had this big aha, I looked up and my wife and I, I went home to my wife and I said, Wendy, we suck. You know, we're the worst parents ever. <laughs> uh, and, you know, obviously we're not, but it'd be... started asking a different question. You know, if we only have X number of spring breaks left where we can really count on this family unit, what would be the best place we could go this year? And we really thoughtfully asked that question, and we've come up with better answers, and now we won't look up in five, ten years and have a lot of regrets about what we didn't do. And so the big takeaway I want everybody to have from this, and this is why we're talking about time blocking, right? It's about your number one resource. You can invest it to know things, to have things, and to do things. I personally, emotionally, am attached to experiences. I want to do things with the people I love. 
And if we don't do something this year, it's not like we get to add a year to the end of our lives, right? It's just gone. That opportunity was missed. Maybe we'll get it, maybe we won't. And we never know how long we have. And so even though we're all positive people, super optimistic, and we want to believe that everything is possible, we've got to adopt this slight mentality of scarcity and realize that we cannot do it all, know it all, or have it all, but we can choose what we will know, have, and do. And the moment we choose, really choose, life really starts to just kind of jump out at us and the rich experience start to show up. So hopefully you're hit, that's hitting you home. You know, for me, it was about my parenting role. Maybe there's something else in you. You're like, you know what? I could make better choices with my time. I could invest it better because I'll tell you, it's the only resource we don't get more of. It's the only resource that we just can't create more of. The time we have is the time we have, and nobody knows how much. So let's invest it the best way possible. So how we do that, right? You know, the short and dirty version of this book is the 80-20 principle. We want to look up and we want to say, wow, what is the fewest things, right, that would give us the biggest results? And this comes from Vilfredo Pareto, an Italian economist. Um, he observed that 80% of the wealth in Italy was held by 20% of the people. And much later, right, back in the, uh, the 1920s, um, a quality control expert named Joseph Durand was introduced to this principle, and he's like, whoa, that's not just economics. That's everything. Because he was about assembly lines, and he was like, wow, you know, 80% of the defects come from 20% of the flaws in the process. And if I can eliminate those, 80% of the bad stuff goes away. Um, I'll tell you, and Gary will just preach it, that this is a actual law of success. It's as real as gravity. We won't mess around with gravity because I can drop my pen or my iPhone and it'll break, right? Gravity shows up fast. But until you actually buy into this, you won't act like it. And it's real. The people who focus on the, the, the vital few are the ones who get the most results in this life. And that is the recipe for exceeding average. And I'll remind you, the subtitle for this book is The Surprisingly Simple Truth Behind Extraordinary Results. We spent those five years not looking at average. We wanted to look at the top players in every industry, from the arts to science to business, right, to athletics. It didn't matter. They all seemed to have this in common. They had this sense that, man, if I absolutely focus with relentless, right, uh, you know, just relentless stubbornness on the things that matter most, I'll get what I want. So I'm going to encourage you to start thinking that way. And the way it shows up, right, is in this idea, we call it going extreme Pareto. There are many, many things that we have to do every day, especially in real estate, right? You've got your closing coming up. You've got your listing appointment coming up. And you've got these checklists that go on for days. What we want you to do is look at that list every morning and say, look, there are many, many things that I could do and probably have to do in the end. But what are the handful that I should do? And then narrow it down to your number one. So you take the 20% of the 20% until you get to your number one. And I'll say really quickly, that doesn't mean that you don't have to do those other things. I get it. But if you start with your top priority, that thing that gets you your real results, bam, everything else does get easier or necessary. And that's the big message here. And I'm going to wager for every person on this call that's in real estate, your number one thing is lead gen. That is the heart and soul of a successful real estate business. It cannot be neglected. It's always got to be growing because if it's not growing, it's shrinking. It's the thing that pushes your success. It allows you to buy leverage. And if you're on the real estate team, you're on this call and you work for a mega, you work as a part of a big brokerage, maybe your job is to help them protect their lead gen time so that that thing can happen in the business. Because if that's not happening in the real estate business, nothing else matters. Now, what do we get if we are willing to take this leap, right, in this world where everything's coming at us a million miles an hour, We've got two screens on every computer. We've got our phone going off in our pocket. We have all the opportunity in the world, right, and lots of obligations. How, what do we get if we say, look, we're going to start saying no. We're going to start saying yes to the, the real things and no to everything else. What do we get? We call this the domino effect. And for us, it was a concession, not just to, you know, this metaphor that one thing can do many, but there are a lot of dominoes, right? We do acknowledge that there's more than one thing every day for all of us. But hopefully everybody on this call is at some point in their lives lined up dominoes, right? And you line them up just so, right? You remember this as a kid, maybe on the floor at your grandparents' house, got the old domino set. If you line them up just so, 
you can knock over one and they'll all fall down. And that's what we want to have in our life. You know, we uh, were looking into this and we said, wow, that's the metaphor. We got to line up our dominoes. How do we line up our dominoes so that we're working on the most important one first? What do we get in exchange for that? And that's a domino run. Uh, we found a group in the Netherlands and the world record holders at the time of writing, they had lined up almost 4.5 million dominoes and by knocking over one, got them all to fall down. So what's clear is that one thing done properly can make many things happen. And then if you look on your screen, had this really cool, like our, one of our researchers dredged up this article from the 80s. You know, we found out that the one thing can't just do many, it can do more. There's this guy, Lorne Whitehead, and he wrote in the American Journal of Physics that you could take a two-inch domino and it would knock over, you know, a three... <clears throat> a three-inch domino, and a three-inch domino will knock over a four-and-a-half-inch domino. And my math breaks down after that, because I'm, I'm an English-French major, but you get the <laughs> point, right? A domino can knock over one that's 50% larger. And he actually built them out of wood. So he had a little two-inch domino on the left, and by the time you went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right, by the eighth domino, it was as big as a door frame. And he said, what began with a gentle tick ended with a large slam. And I just love that because it's about momentum, right? When you do your one thing day in and day out, you don't just get the, the actual effects of having done it. You get better at it, and you start to get multiples of that return because your skills grow and the momentum grows behind you. And we wanted to explore, like, how far can you take this idea? So I got on my you know, little Excel spreadsheet, being the nerd that I am, and I started with a two-inch domino, and we just played it out. And this is not even two full sets of dominoes. If you play that, those physics out, right, start with a two-inch domino. By the 18th domino, it would knock over one taller than the Tower of Pisa. By the 23rd, it would knock over one taller than the Eiffel Tower. And I, I just want you to think for one second, the Eiffel Tower looks really small on your screen, about the size of those earrings, right, that maybe you bought when you visited Paris. The tower itself, because there's no backdrop against it, it's hard to imagine its scale. It's over a thousand feet tall, people. It's almost as tall as the Empire State Building. It's the tallest. It would be the tallest building in Seattle if you erected it there. It would be the tallest building in Boston. It would be the tallest building by twice in Austin. So you look at your skyline, and chances are, unless you're in like Chicago or New York, there's no building that would be taller than that in your peripheral vision. Wow. By the time you got to 31, starting with that two-inch domino that progression of momentum would knock over a domino that would be 3,000 feet above the tallest place on Earth, Everest. And by the 57th, if it was physically possible, and obviously it's not, it would cover the distance between the Earth and the Moon. And so that's what we want. We want a geometric progression, right? We want things to be growing and growing, like compound interest, so that over time, what begins so small that you really didn't pay attention to it will be so big you can hardly imagine it. And I'm just going to posit there, after studying this now for almost eight years, that, that that hockey stick on its side, that's the shape of the graph. That's the true shape of extraordinary success. That people start small, and they keep hammering their way at the one thing, sometimes accidentally and sometimes on purpose. And then they look up, and wow, they're at the Eiffel Tower. And then they look up, and wow, they're at Mount Everest. And then, boom, it just explodes on them. I know that for a fact that was the progression of Keller Williams Realty. When I joined this company in 2000, they already had four straight years of 40% year-over-year growth. And when I joined, there were only 6,700 agents. And that was almost 20 years into the journey. We looked up, and now it's, what, 15 years later, and <laughs> boom, there's 140,000. Right? The, the geometric progression of a great company, Apple, you can look at so many companies that follow this progression. And you can also look at athletes and skills where people did this thing, and after their 10,000 hours, mastery kicks in, and big things start happening. So this is what I want for you in real estate. Well, I want Jay, you to look at, yeah, man. There's a great question that came out in regards to this uh, as you're building. Mm -hmm. Ryan Ogle asked, on a mega agent team, do you want each team member to have a different one thing or the same one thing? I think on a team of specialists, everybody has their one thing. I'm a buyer specialist. I'm a showing agent. I'm a listing specialist. I'm a listing, you know, admin. Those are all their specialists. But the one thing for the team is lead gen. And on our team, everyone participates, except for the admins, right? You have to be licensed. 
but we have people that are working the phones. We do scripts and dialogues every morning. Our buyer agents are working their spheres. Our listing agent is out there calling on FISBOs and expireds. We have a, a massive group of people focused on the one thing for the company, and that's how we launch our days. Now, their trade thing may be something else, like I'm going to take listings or I'm going to work with buyers. That is their role on the thing, uh, role on the team, but they all can touch lead gen. So hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, so everybody has the same one thing, <clears throat> but everybody's role is different. Um, right. I mean, go to Google. What's Google's one thing? Right, it's actually advertising, but they use search. <laughs> I was gonna say, at this point, you know, what is their one thing? There's so many. But, um, I know, but in the, for years and years, they were essentially a search company. They got all their revenue from advertising, and it's still the vast majority of it. I guarantee you, if you walk through the halls of that building, you could find anybody and connect the dots between what they do, <coughs> even the front desk person, and how those goals are met. Because they track it all. They are so scientific about it. So every company has a one thing, but everyone in the company has a one thing that should line up around that to protect it or make it happen. And I'll just tell you that on the screen, I just did a geometric progression, right, in real estate. So this is that same 50% year over year growth in volume. I've seen this happen, and I've seen it happen at faster trajectories than this. I remember it was maybe seven years ago now, um, we had three agents on the screen um, on stage, and um, it was like Krissa Acker, Ben Kinney, and uh, Keith Riddle, and they all had five years or less in real estate, and they were all doing more than 50 million. Wow. And I remember what Gary said. He said, no matter where you are today, you're less than five years from knocking it absolutely out of the park. And that, that what he didn't say is, if you do your one thing. That's very but, true. That's very true. And the, the progression here is people look up and they're like, oh, you know, I only did three million this year. And they look at that 50 million over there and they're like, that just feels just crazy. That doesn't matter. All you focus on is if you're at three million this year, right? Is that how do I end the year or in the next 12 months go to 6.6? 6. And that's mm -hmm. your only focus, right? That's your one thing. How do I do enough lead gen to hit that? And by the way, the gap between 6.6 6 and 9.9, .9, it's still a big leap but you'll understand that gap when you get there. And just like when you get to 22, the gap between that and 33 seems huge today. It's more than you're doing right now. But at 22, that gap will feel manageable. You'll have the people in place and the systems in place. So that's kind of the way we work it, right? It's absolutely achievable. You just take one day at a time, one week at a time, and you work backwards from that big goal. So how do we make this happen? Um, the Can question, I, just, I just want to interject for a second. There's yeah, a quote. There's a quote in the book, um, in the chapter about big, about being big. What's the What's that chapter called again? I'm sorry. Um, uh, big is bad. Yeah, big is bad. So <clears throat> I was rereading some of the book last night to prepare, um, and I just love this quote: "When big is believed to be bad, small thinking rules the day, and big never sees the light of it." I think that that's such an amazing quote because there's so many agents that feel that when it comes to real estate, you know, being on a team that's just so massive um, can't be good for uh, the consumer. But I actually disagree with that uh, because there's so many more working parts helping the consumer. So I think it's true when you have when you when you have a when you when your one thing is to is to just take off on that trajectory um, you know, that's going to be your mindset, thinking big all the time. And that's what we try to do on a regular basis. Um, and, you know, we're going to be interviewing Gary Vaynerchuk in a couple weeks. And I love his quote where he runs his business in, uh, the, in the dirt and in the clouds, where he gets his hands dirty and is also always thinking at a high level. Um, so I think those two quotes really go hand in hand. Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And I, I don't want to knock the solo agent. A lot of them are doing massive, massive production. A lot of them have, like, assistants, right? They would say, I'm, a, I'm not a team. There are ways to success for both. But in our, I mean, we, us, all we do is interview top, top teams and agents around the country. I would tell you the fastest path is actually through the team. It doesn't mean the other one is impossible, but the fastest, most efficient path is through that, through that means, in my opinion. So... This question at the heart of the book, you know, what's the one thing I can do such that by doing it, everything else will be easier or necessary, is a question that's been around for a long time. And I'm just going to 
break it down a little bit for you. Um, I want you to ask it that way. What's the one thing, not two or three, and it's what I can do, not I could or should or would do. What can I do today? And that just tells you right now, you're asking your brain for a question. What's the most powerful lever you have in your arsenal? In the 80-20 sense, what's the biggest thing I can pull right now, right now today? And I say can do because I always quote Shel Silverstein. There's a great poem we gave our kids. All the woulda, coulda, shouldas all ran away and hid from one little did. And action gets you into that feedback loop, and you start to figure out what really works from what doesn't. It's not an intellectual game anymore. Such that by doing it just says there's got to be more than one domino. And the scale of that domino run is everything will be easier or necessary. The answer, as I've implied and said directly, for real estate agents, for their teams, their business, is, is lead gen. And when you do that, the easier or necessary does show up. One, you can afford leverage. You can bring specialists on. You can bring on help so that you don't have to do it all. And two, if you have an abundance of leads to work, one, you're creating more opportunity for everyone. Everyone's more engaged. And two, you can actually choose who you work with. I remember the first couple of years from my wife, watching her take listings and working with people that were not great clients that she really should have fired, but because she didn't know what the, listing, the next listing was coming from, she maybe stuck with them when they shouldn't. And the moment she made the commitment, it was about two years into her journey to truly making this thing happen, she knew that, you know what, this is not the right client for me. This house is probably not going to sell. They're probably going to steal tons of time, you know, time from my family. And even though I would get a sign in the yard and maybe a buyer, it's not worth the time of my life to work this. And she would start firing clients. That's one of the things that you're allowed to do when you're really killing it on this front. You can actually choose who you choose to work with, and you can refer the rest out. You don't have to drive out into the boondocks and leave your family and miss dinner to catch that $150,000 listing because you have an abundance of business in your backyard. You can refer that out. So you ask this question to get you to the heart, and in our experience in research, it's always going to come back to research, I mean, to, to, real, to, to lead gen. Um, this graph on the page, I'm going to leave it up because I know it's a small screen for a lot of you, maybe a phone, and I'll walk you through it. But this is probably my favorite page in the book, guys. It's, it's page 114, and it's all the areas in your life where we've identified that you can ask this question. Our goal, right, is to build, figure out our one thing and then make a habit of doing it. That's really what this book teaches us to do. And the trick here is, your job is down at the bottom, and we start at the top. So we actually first ask the question, what's the one thing I can do for my spiritual life, such that by doing it, everything else will be easier and necessary? Right? If you don't know why you're here, you may be postponing a kind of a big question. Right? Um, what's the one thing I can do for my physical health? What's the one thing I can do for my personal life, my key relationships, my job, my business, my fin finances? And for us, those were the seven places you might ask this powerful question and try to get your answers. And I'll tell you, over the years, I'll show you my calendar before we're done. My wife, Wendy, and I have asked the question as a family and said, what is the habits we're going to bring to our lives and our home that we can make sure that each of these important areas is being fed in the, in the best way possible? Um, I'm going to just kind of, some people have questions, a lot of questions, and I'll try to get ahead of those. We start with yeah. spiritual, physical, and personal life. Um, and that comes before your job and even other key relationships. And a lot of working moms, and there's tons of them in this industry, right? They're going to come up to me after I give the speech and they say, how can I put my personal life in front of my kids? And I try to remind them as kindly as I can that, you know, in the airplane, when you're told to put on the oxygen mask, do you put it on for yourself first or your kids first? And every single time they know the answer, you put it on yourself first, right? Right. Because if you don't take care of yourself, you may not be there to take care of the ones that you love the most. And that's the principle that helped us make that decision. And I'll tell you, if you're... you're that's such a good what's that, man? Dude, that is awesome. That is a, that, that's just, like, amazing. I'm going to post that up. It's so it, true. It's a, it's a great truth in life, right? <clears throat> it's easy to neglect. It's easy to rationalize. I'm doing all of this for them. But if you aren't taking care of yourself, you know, your spirit, your body... And honestly, your mind, your personal life, you don't have a hobby at all to de-stress. You're shortening your time with those people, and that's not a gift to them at all. So you can rationalize it being for them, but it doesn't usually play out that way. And I usually, you know, my joke is, 
um, for especially for a lot of the working women in real estate that are you know giving up their weekends and all that. Going to the spa once a quarter does not make, mean you have a personal life, right? You need to look up and say, how can I make some of these things happen? Like my wife, we work out together. That's a big thing. But one of the ways she gets to spend time with her best friends is they go running together. I know moms that do art together or they go to yoga together. Um, they come up with a way right, to mix maybe three or four circles together to make sure that that thing is happening so that they're always nourishing that part of themselves. Um, the job in business is one, and we've touched on this already. Every business has a one thing, right? In real estate, the one thing for all businesses is lead gen, but everyone also has a job in that business, and what your one thing is should line up with the one thing for your business, right? Um, in Southwest Airlines, they made their one thing about being the low-cost airlines, and everything they do, every job lines up around that. That's why they have the cattle call, right? They didn't want to waste the paper on all those tickets. They wanted it to happen fast. Um, they bought all the same airplanes and worked out of secondary airports. Everything they did was about their business one thing, and everybody knew how to line up around that so that they could make a very cheap, inexpensive experience. You know, we don't serve food, just nuts. Well, why don't we hire comedians, right? And we'll keep them distracted so they won't be hungry, whatever that is. And they've become the most powerful airline in the world by doing their one thing so well. So there's that dance, and in your business, do you know your business is one thing, and do you know your one thing and how it lines up? And like for me, my one thing is I write books, right? I help Gary write books, and we teach those books. And that lines up with the mission of our business. Gary is the chairman of the board of the largest real estate company in the world right now, and his one thing is to coach and train. So it's not always what you think it is, but you can make those dominoes line up. Um, so here's an exercise. I want everybody to either take out their iPhone and get to their notes app or just to grab a piece of paper. I want you to really quickly think about your spiritual life, your physical health, your personal life, right, your hobbies or lack thereof, your key relationships, your job, your business, and financial. And if you don't own a business, you can skip that one, right? I want you to give yourself a rating. Score yourself from 1 to 10 where 1 is you know what, you're just failing. There's no way around it. And a 10 is you're just knocking it out of the park. There's no room for improvement. I want you to take, I'm just going to give you 30 seconds because I don't want you to overthink this. I want you to start filling in those for yourself. So how are you doing in your spiritual life on a scale of 1 to 10? How are you doing with your physical health, a scale of 1 to 10? Your personal life, your key relationships, your job, if you have a business, how is that happening for you right now, right? What about your financial world? Are you on top of it? Score yourself on a scale of 1 to 10, right? And there's, there's method to this madness. What I'm wanting you to do right now is I want you to look at those numbers that you've written down. And I'm going to give you two choices, right? Your one thing for your business, right, is going to be lead gen, your job. Um, hopefully that's a good number. You can choose right now any of these areas if you want to make a commitment during this webinar to start changing your life, to take the next step. I would love for that to be lead gen, but this is an exercise that I think helps people get clarity. You can go to the area that's been the most neglected, which is going to be the, the easiest to raise up, or you can take a strength, I don't really care, or you can go right to lead gen, which is kind of our theme, and say, you know what, that's my number right now. What will it take to take that seven and make it a nine? I personally don't believe tens exist, right? Um, I think that that perfection um, is a unicorn, and we can all always be striving to be better. But how can I turn whatever that number is into a nine so that I can do it better? And that's where I maybe want you to take the first steps after this call is make a commitment to yourself, and hopefully you're having an aha here about something that you could be doing better, that you could be pursuing at a higher level, so that your life won't ever be average there. It has the opportunity to be extraordinary for you and the people you love. So you ask that question, what's the one thing I can do for that area of my life such that by doing it, everything else will be easier and necessary? In my experience, most people know the answer and they feel guilty for having neglected it. You know, maybe it's their physical life. They know that one of the reasons they're not getting as much done in their business is their health isn't where it should be. They feel tired too early in the day. Their mental energy just isn't there. And they know that if they got on a diet or they started working out, that that would change for them. I'll tell you, we just walked a group of people, 100 people, um, paid to be in a special coaching program. 
and they paid a thousand dollars and we've walked them through a 66 day challenge right it takes 66 days in our research to build a habit and I'll tell you people chose anywhere in here Nick and Tristan it didn't matter what they chose some people were like I'm gonna start every day by reading the Bible some people were like it's two hours of Legion every day it didn't matter where they went when people truly made a commitment to make a change in their life started protecting that time and fighting for it it had a halo effect in all the other areas they started feeling confident they started taking control of their time and that ultimately is the point because when you feel like you're in the driver's seat that you can say yes to what's important and no to everything else and it just takes practice in one area the other pieces start to fall together that's how you get that momentum so here's the reality right the the mechanics of time blocking is where we're going knowing your one thing and doing it are very different we fail on that test every single day right I do it all the time. I know what my one thing should be. Don't always do it. Well, how do we make that thing happen? Well, we believe it's time blocking. What I love about time blocking, it's something that you already do. It's hey, making Jay. appointments. Yeah, man. <clears throat> Just wanted to interject for a second because you asked, you know, we asked that question in the group yesterday for you about how we asked how you're doing how people are doing with their time blocking. Yeah, man. So yeah, so we had eighty six responses. I would say like 90% was okay so the questions were the question was how are you doing time blocking A was I'm hearing about time blocking for the first time B I know it's important and I need it C I'm doing good and I want to do better or D I'm kicking butt but I'm seeking mastery um, so I would say like 90% of those 86 responses were B I know it's important and I need help with it I, you know, I got a chance, I logged on this morning and looked at that too, and I thought, wow, so people are kind of aware of what we're talking about. I did see some people who are like, all right, this is, I'm, this is the first I've heard of it, and I'm <laughs> going to tell them the basics too. But the vast majority, um, they, they, they're struggling, and so hopefully we can give them some really practical understanding of how this works yeah. so that they can tackle this and start having more success. And I, I love that. I, every time I teach it, I ask that question in a live audience. The vast majority of people are in B. They know they should be better stewards of their time. They kind of understand the principles, but they need a little boost. So thank you for that interjection and reminding us of that. Um, hopefully you've, you know, when he asked that question, you just immediately scored yourself, right, where you sit in that spectrum. But making appointments with yourself is nothing new. It's actually quite simple, um, but it's something we don't do often enough. When I first interviewed with Gary Keller back in, um, it would have been in 2002, I was already working at his company, but he was interviewing me for the opportunity to write books with him. Um, the first thing he asked for from me was my calendar. Um, he asked if he could look at it. Um, thankfully, I'm, I'm pretty much of an introvert, so whereas most people's appointment books are all about appointments with other people, mine was just my task list, what I was supposed to do every day. And his belief system and what he learned from working, the only three people he worked for were all millionaires, is that really successful people make appointments with themselves and they do that so they can get their most important work done. Um, it's really brilliant and it's really so simple. Like when my phone tells me, hey, you know, your lab coat agent's call is 15 minutes away, I know what to do with that already, right? I know to start transitioning to my next task. We already know how to operate within our calendars. The thing we're failing to do is to block time off for ourselves. And there's some real science behind this, folks. Um, this actually came out after the book was published. I, I, I kills me, right? The book is, we found this after the book was published, rather. Um, it was in the British Journal of Health Psychology, and I'll just kind of unwrap this really quickly. They asked three groups of people to start exercising for 20 minutes a day for two weeks, and they wanted to see what was the best way to get them to do this. So they have a control group, which means they don't do anything, right? You know, go exercise for 20 minutes a day, folks. They had a motivation group, and they prepared a little pamphlet about how all the, the beneficial effects of exercising for just a few minutes a day for you. You know, improve your heart, improve your health, improve your energy, improve your love life. I mean, the whole shebang and all the reasons to be motivated to do this thing. And then the last group, they called it the intention group. They were also given that pamphlet, right, to control for motivation, but they had to do one additional thing. They had to make a written statement for every day. On this day, I will exercise for 20 minutes at this time. And a stated activity, they call that intention. I would call that an appointment. And if you look at the results, 
they were nearly three times more likely to get the job done than the other two groups. And this usually sparks the question, well, doesn't you know, your big why, your motivation matter? Absolutely. I believe, right, because the group three had that as well, but I think that when you put a when and where along with your why, that's when it actually happens. And this is some evidence that absolutely lines up to support that. The simple act of calendaring their intention made it three times more likely to happen. So in our book, one of the things that we want people to do, really simply, if you're just starting on this journey, right, focus on three things and three things only. Time block your time off, right? Vacation time. If you're going to be extraordinary, you're going to need to rest. And the beautiful thing about launching your year, my wife and I do a retreat every year in November where we plan out the next year. And, you know, we don't get it all planned out, but we start blocking out, like, I think we might do this vacation or that vacation. And when are the kids' breaks? And we start blocking those times off on our calendar early. Because what we don't want to do is accidentally double book ourselves. That's how we end up you know, having a laptop on the beach. Whereas if we're really clear that we're like, you've probably done this. You had a really big vacation. Maybe you're going to Italy and you were absolutely not going to work. That this was a thing on your calendar and you told people to work around it. And that's how that works. Was this that is question my, or Nick? What was the question? Oh, I was going to interject saying this is my biggest, uh, <clears throat> this is my biggest issue right here. And I hear it from my wife all day long. I, it's so hard for me to time block like a real one day off. I know Tristan has this problem too. I know Tristan never takes an entire day off and I, I yell at him about it. It's so hard to do this for some reason for me. And, um, you know, I, I really, I, and if it's, you know, like <clears throat> you were saying, you got a calendar and if it's not in the calendar, it doesn't exist. So I really think that, you know, and my wife's been telling me I got to put days off in the calendar, you know, and just like, have no qualms about not having an appointment that day, and and that's just the way um, you know that's just the way it goes. And and you have to then protect it, and we'll talk about that. But like you know, so you've said that this Saturday is a no appointment day, and you know your admin's like, well, this is the only time they can meet. That's where the rubber hits the road, right? You have to make a decision: Am I going to break my time block with myself and chase this one piece of business, or because I'm doing my one thing so well, I'm going to say, you know what? If they really can't do it, tell them, I'm sorry, I can't meet with them. I'm happy to hook them up with someone who can. If yeah, you had a team, it. that's when you would say, you got to cover me. And I'll just share it. This is not – I love that you guys both voiced up that you struggle with this. I think it's endemic to our industry. and It's one of the reasons there's so much turnover because people just burn out. Really successful people burn out because they never get a break, and they suffer, and their family suffers. <laughs> So yep. making that commitment, um, we went on a two-week vacation to Italy a couple of years ago with my whole family. We rented a house in Provence. It was actually France. And I remember Wendy and I got up in the mornings because we were used to getting up really early to work out already before the whole house. And we'd get on our email and just kind of manage a little bit. But we both made a really co big commitment to kind of stay out of work. And usually, you know, after about 30 minutes of tooling around on Facebook, maybe answering a stray email, we go for a run. And that was it. And on the flight back, we're sitting by each other. And I turned to her and I said, you know, for two weeks, you were a business owner, right? You didn't have a job in your business. How did that feel? And I thought she was going to cry. She was like, it was amazing. And I just said, you have a choice when you go back because she had built a team around her. Do you want to go back having a job in your business or do you want to keep working towards being an owner? And she made the decision to keep the job because she didn't think the business was in a place where she could make that permanent. But she got a taste of what we try to talk about in The Millionaire Real Estate Agent, that seventh level, where you've effectively replaced yourself in your business. My mother, everybody. Roberta Baldwin. <laughs> oh, really? That's her. There you go. Boom. Okay. <laughs> job, right? All right. Anyway, I'm in her office. What, do you, what, can you, what can you expect? All right. Sorry. Go ahead. So you've got your, your vacation blocked off, right? Because you're going to have big success. You're going to need a few breaks. Um, if I showed you Gary Keller's calendar, Every other month, there would be at least one week blocked off. And you've asked him, where are you going? he go, I don't know, but it's blocked off, and I'm not taking any appointments there until I absolutely know that I'm not leaving. Wow. It. Super aggressive about this, right? This? Are you listening to this, Tristan? Dude, I'm like... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to so, call your wife when we're done and tell her that's what you're going to do next. Yeah, don't, please. <laughs> so, the next thing I want you to do is time block your one thing, right, which is lead gen time. And we want you to do it in the morning. You can see the breakout over here on the lower screen, the lower right, 
We want you to do it in the morning and without getting too much inside baseball, but if you read the book, there's this thing called willpower, and it's our mental energy to focus on what we need to do and say no to everything else, and it's strongest in the morning. So the best possible time to establish that habit is when your willpower is strong. And then the only other thing you really have to do is your planning time. And I'll tell you, I usually do it on Fridays or Sundays. I'll look at my next week and I'll look at my goals and just ask, do I have enough time blocked on my one thing to hit my goals? If the answer is no, I start stealing time back from other things. Just canceling appointments, I'm sorry, can we do it later? And if the answer is yes, my job is done. Because I'm just managing around one huge objective, right? Yeah. Am I getting that thing done? <clears throat> With that planning, that one hour, um, what time are you usually doing that planning? In the morning, in the midday, or in the evening? I mean, somebody you asked know, that. I'll either do it on a Friday afternoon. If I can end my week with some semblance, right, of sanity, it's not putting out fires until the moment I go home, um, I love to do it there because then I don't really have to address it too much over the weekend. Otherwise, sometimes we have um, a late Sunday morning, you know, after all the stuff, is, your Sunday morning stuff is done, I usually sit down with the laptop and just kind of plan out my week. And it's usually only about 10 to 15 minutes of work, except for the first, the, you know, the weekend before the first of a month, because then I'm looking at my whole month. You know, <clears throat> are we on track for our goals? Do I need to make adjustments? And then, obviously, at the beginning of the year, I told you my wife and I, we just get an, a, a hotel like on Priceline, get an overnight babysitter, We'll go to dinner the night before, talk about our goals for the next year, and the whole next day we sit there working on our goals and, and our, our time planning. So depending on what block of time you're looking at, a year, a month, or a week, it can be as long as an afternoon. It can be as long as an hour, maybe for a month long, but usually it's just like 15 minutes. And then I'm just the first thing I do when I get to the office is I look at my calendar. You know, What did I say I was going to do today? And then my boss is my calendar. Nice. So the, the other trick, and this actually got cut from the book, but I love it, and I always like to teach it. If your life is just so hectic that the idea of working with calendar times just doesn't work for you, like, you know, I drop my kids off, you know, at different times of the day, or I'm a college student, too, and I have, you know, my, my every day my calendar is different. Here's another proven formula for making this happen. You pick a time. And you are a thing, like an established habit, like brushing your teeth and say, after that thing, I will do this thing. And a guy named B.J. Fogg got 10,000 people to start flush, flossing their teeth by saying, after I brush my teeth, I will floss one tooth. And his whole thing was, just starting the activity almost always lets them finish it. But they get victory regardless. So the moment I arrive at the office, I will call one former client. And usually that will lead to a string of it. It can be that simple. The moment you cross the threshold, you know that that trigger has been, you know, you've hit the tripwire. I've got to do this thing now. It's highly, highly effective. And I know we're getting to the time where we need to kind of turn it over to questions. I've just got um, two more slides, guys. This, when you look at my seven areas, and it took us years to put this in place, right, because you only do one habit at a time. My wife and I have built these habits in our life where three days a week we have a trainer show up. Um, at one time I was 245 plus pounds um, post back surgery and I had a long journey back and this was the, the anchor habit. When I work out I eat better and working out together as a couple was just such a blessing. I just, I couldn't even tell you the extra accountability and what it did for our marriage. I gotta uh, say I, I agree so much with that because uh, I used to be 220 pounds yeah. Uh, and so, you know, I fluctuate every now and again, nothing to that extent, but, you know, when I do exercise with my wife, it's just like, it's just so much, it's so much more invigorating, you got someone there, like, making sure you get it done, you know, you're at the gym for an hour, you know, it, 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 you're not leaving until that hour is up, I mean, it's definitely, um, you know, it's definitely, uh, it gives you a motivation. Well, for us, it was we had small kids, and so we didn't want to do it separately and both be missing evening time with the kids because we both had big jobs, right, big businesses. Yeah. So we, the only time we could do this is when the kids were asleep. So our first trainer would show up at our driveway at 5 a.m. So we had to get up Ooh. at 4.40 to make this happen. Thankfully now, we've moved that to 5.30. That extra 20 minutes is huge, by the way. Um, but I still am launching my days with this activity, which gives me energy throughout the day. Um, I make my calls 
um, on Wednesdays, the number one thing I can do for my business is meet with talent. And it's just a habit. Every Wednesday, I'm at the same coffee shop, and I'm meeting another stranger that I've been told is a really talented human being. And that's led to lots of hires in our businesses. My one thing, obviously, is writing. That happens. And then we do our net worth as our financial habit, which is from the millionaire real estate investor. And we do that monthly. And we do it usually on a weekend morning. My big aha for you here is five out of the seven areas are all happening before noon because that's when we have willpower to get it done. Um, our spiritual habit of saying thanks with our kids is something we already were having dinner, so we piggyback the habit onto our dinners together. And then my, my, my best friend is my wife, and so seeing her when you have two kids 16 months apart, that was a struggle, so we established a date night. And again, so that it can persist and be a habit, we tried Friday and Saturday, but you guys are parents, you know what the deal is. There's no babysitters, right? So there was no consistency to when we could go out on the weekends, so we moved it to Wednesday night. And the whole world knows that Wednesday night is date night for us, and it's so funny. You know, our, our favorite table at the favorite restaurant is always open. We can always get into the movies. It just happens now. And, you know, our commitment to never go more than seven days without reminding us why we had the Rugrats, man, it's, it's working. So... You've got this thing, and you can build habits one at a time and build kind of your perfect life. And I'm not saying by any means that ours is perfect, but, Ben, it's a lot better than what it was just by focusing on a few key areas. So this is really kind of the last point. You put it on your calendar, guys. How do you protect that time? So four quick principles. Find a bunker. Find an area where you normally can get focus. Maybe it's your home office away from everybody. Maybe it's in the office. I like the accountability of having eyes on me, right? I go in, I put my do not disturb up, and I get to work, and that brings accountability. So find that place where you can consistently focus on your one thing. And for calls, I mean, I've heard of people taking rolling bags into conference rooms and calling because if they got all the way to their office, they would get lost in their email, right? I've had people do it in their car before they even enter the building. Wherever you get focus, that's your bunker. Two, store provisions. The last thing you need to do in that space is leave it to go get a cup of coffee or a donut, right? So whatever you need to be doing that job, have it with you there. We call that getting sniped. When you leave to get a cup of coffee, of course, someone's going to say, oh, Nick, oh, Tristan, I was hoping you would step out for just a minute. And it's one of those, do you got a minute, which always turn into 30 minutes. And you look up and your time block is gone. So just yeah. avoid it, right? Have provisions. Sweet. <coughs> yeah, man. Is there no, a that's it. That's that an easy. That's just no, a coughing. coughing, but the store provisions part and not leaving the the area where you're calling or where you're prospecting is huge. Every time you leave, you get caught up talking to somebody for an hour. Man, it can totally derail your day, right? It just it's so simple. You start talking about the basketball game last night, and you look up, and all your momentum is gone, and you have to restart when you go back into your space. So avoid it like the plague. Sweep for mines. Um, for most of this. Um, it's, it's our cell phone, right? That environment, all those notifications popping up that you got a comment on Facebook or Twitter, turn them all off. Just Google it, how to turn off notifications on my phone and get rid of them. You don't need to be distracted by a referral that's showing up, right? You see this and you, you know what? Everything we justify as a referral. Oh, there's a comment on my Facebook page. Maybe it's a referral. I'll go over there. <laughs> right for two hours, right or an hour even. If you just want to start really small, you are not going to lose enough business to worry about it. You will create far more business if you stay focused. And the last one is just enlist support, folks. Tell the people around you that matter why it's so important for you to be there doing this, how it impacts their lives, and they will help hold you accountable. You know, I had an assistant, and if she saw me straying out of my bunker she would grab whatever I had in my hands and just say, you know, I'll take care of this. Go back in. I got this. And she knew that sometimes I needed a little help to stay focused, and she would give that to me. And I empowered her to do that because um, she knew if I failed, we both failed. And she was totally clear that why the mission was there for both of us. So, you know, I'm going to end on this, like going back. Thank you for letting me teach this. Hopefully we can catch some people's questions before we wrap up. If people want to know more about this, um, definitely check out Time Blocking Mastery. We've just completed the, the pilot version of the course. We're in okay. our last couple of weeks, and we're going to walk people through 10 weeks of training. 10 weeks, right? 
where you get the, the whole shebang, and then they can go in and learn more about it. So you can go and just sign up for the email, and we'll, when we launch the course, you'll be the first to know. <clears throat> what I love about this time blocking topic is that, you know, obviously the book has a lot of different uh, topics that it covers, but multitasking, and we can get into a whole other webinar about that, but I feel that time blocking and multitasking, um, you know, uh, are, so are somewhat the same category because there's no such thing as doing one thing while you're doing multiple things at the same time. So when you're time blocking, make sure it's each, you know, uh, categorized. Right, Jay? That's right. The, um, I'm trying to make sure that my – I'm trying to go back to the camera. There, there we are. are. There we go. Um, yeah, the multitasking, every time you switch back and forth, there's this lag, right? You make the decision to switch, and it's squirrel, right? You know, that little distraction. <laughs> and that's instantaneous, and we, we squirrel all day long in this industry, right? Um, the thing is, your brain has to switch modes. You know, if you were writing a really important email to your client, you know, you're describing the offer terms and all of that, you're two paragraphs into the three paragraph, you know, thing, and you get distracted. When you come back ten minutes later, what do you have to do? You have to reread the whole thing, right, before you can get back to that last paragraph, or you're maybe not going to do it as well as you could. And researchers tell us that those little distractions bouncing back and forth to phone calls and emails and now Twitter, um, about 28% of every day is lost to this reorientation time, where you're reorienting back to the task. And that has a huge cost, right? That's, that's a quarter of your day that's just lost to these multitasking inefficiencies. Very true. Tristan actually has his email notifications off on his phone, right? Yeah, I have them off. Yeah. Way to go, That's man. not always good, Jay. So. <laughs> but there, you know, I actually turn yeah. off. There are, if you believe it or not, there are actually times of the day where I turn off Facebook as a whole on my phone completely. If you can believe it. But you it definitely, definitely does help. You know, what I, mean, I learned about the iPhone is if you just go to the bottom and you swipe up, yeah, a little half moon. And yeah. so you can just put it on do not disturb for your lead gen time, and it keeps all those notifications at bay. You can oh, still that's call. That's for? Yeah. I just got an iPhone, so. There you go. It's, it's, the, it's the do not disturb button, and it's an easy setting. It took me, like Ben Kinney had to show me how to turn my notifications off. And it's and very it's manual. I have all these kids games on my phone because every time <laughs> we're in the car, like, can I have your phone? And so if I'm writing this, I don't need a little alert saying feed the dinosaurs popping up and distracting me, right? <laughs> so true. Yeah, that's like the great recipe for losing my job. So, you know, it. I had to manually do a lot of that, but the fast, fast path is just go to the do not disturb button. And you don't have to stop multitasking all the time. Just do it. Stop multitasking when you're doing your most important work. Sure. If you were a surgeon or a pilot, they wouldn't let you multitask while you did surgery or were flying. That's you know, so true. Your wow. job is no less important because this is the life you chose. This is your life that's at stake, not someone else's. So just stop for that little tiny period of time and then just gloriously multitask all the rest. I don't care. But just if you don't do it while you do your one thing, it matters a lot. Tristan, are there questions? questions in the group? I have a question here from the group. Sure. Uh, when you brought up your strengths and your weaknesses, which one you want to focus on for that one thing, what have you seen works best, focusing on your weakness or for focusing on your strength? Um, I think that most people are motivated to move away from pain. Um, I think it's just a fact. That's what we use in our listing presentations, right? You know, it's like, when do you want to move? Great. You know, what will happen if you can't sell your house? And that's the question that tells you if there's any pain attached. Because if they're like, oh, we'll just live here, well, they're not going to lower the price. They're not going to stage it. The pain is where the pressure comes from. So I find that people, they'll look at their physical health. Um, yeah, that's the number one habit that most people do. Um, taking control of that will have a halo effect everywhere else. And if that's where your motivation truly is, then go there. Um, I think most people kind of intuitively know. They'll think, oh, I need to focus on my business. This is a business class. Um, I actually, in this, the 100 students that went through the first version of Time Blocking Mastery proved it. It didn't matter what you were doing. When you make the commitment to control your time, it spills over into every area of your life. Nice. All right. I think I'm going to watch this web webinar like 10 times in a row. <laughs>
So true, dude. I know I missed some things. No, just because it, it, you know it, this is probably the biggest, um, the biggest uh, challenge for 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 most people. I mean, just especially the days off. I mean, you know, you have to tell you, I have to tell myself over and over again, it's okay to take a day off, and especially if you have like a week in real estate where like you know maybe there wasn't it wasn't as productive or you know a deal fell apart and you feel like you gotta make up for it you know so you can't take that day off but but it's actually the opposite you need to take that day off to like recoup and get your thoughts together so you can then go make up for it and be a stronger person um, and that's where I where I fall short yeah well we all do man we all if you're really striving for greatness and clearly you guys are I mean the community you've built a lot of the people in the community I know it's hard to turn it off, but when you do, you're restored. Not only does your clients get the better you, but your family and you get the better you too. So it's 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 a habit. You just have to build it. I mean, why do you think there's only 16 games in a football season, right? It's 16, right? I hope I'm right about that. It's because it's so it's such a challenging sport. You just can't go play one game after the other after the other. So you know you got to give your your mind some time to relax. One yeah. last question, Jay. Um, yeah, man. One person tried to log on to your site here, the Time Blocking Mastery. Is it, it only for, is it only for KW Associates? No, it's not. It's for everyone. Um, okay, we've got a special that. link on there that says if you're with KW, I think we're offering a pretty healthy discount. You know, we've already been building this product within our company. Our agents have supported it. Gary didn't want to be that guy. Um, with his hand out for more money every single time. So we did offer them a very special discount, and um, that's totally cool. But everyone, we have people from every brokerage in the world pretty much cool. in that first group and people from multiple industries. And by the way, the One Thing book is not a KW-specific book either. It's actually not even a real estate-specific book. You, anybody in any industry could read this book and take and take and and get takeaways from it. Yeah, it's a, a lot of people actually in real estate are give, being given it by their husband or spouse that's working in another industry. It's like, oh, we're at Genentech and we had this workshop. You should read this book. And they then show up at the, the you know our convention or whatever. I'm like, oh, that's cool. Jay, where do we go? Where would somebody go to get the book? You, you mentioned it to me before. It was what? Where? What's website? Um, our home base is the one thing dot com with the number one. The one. Um, Thing they yeah, can buy it from us world. there, and obviously Amazon, Barnes and Noble, any of the indie stores. You know, I, I don't care if you can get it and you're interested. It's definitely the the lies that we've been talking about multitasking, willpower. They can get a lot more depth in this discussion from the book. All right, perfect, man. I just posted it up. Jay, thanks so much, man. This was hey, amazing. This has been amazing. Oh. We know you're a busy guy, um, and we. Truly appreciate uh, you taking the time to do this for us. It was Thanks awesome. Thanks for taking a few hours to do this, man, because I know you had to prepare for it too. So you had to deal with us. <laughs> yeah. That was that's, a pleasure. That's, that's very difficult. So. Well, again, thank you for having me. I told you this is a big part of my goals is to share this message this year, and so thank you for letting me do that, and thanks for all y'all do with your pirate hats and lab coat agents. Thanks, oh, boy, Captain Tristan. Thanks, Jay. Have a great day, man. Have a great day, man.